Julian Krolik. I'm a professor in the physics and astronomy department at Hopkins. But we're here today for a reason that has nothing to do with astrophysics and black holes, which is how I spend my time, but is really all about what my wife does. And she'll introduce herself. Hi, I'm Elaine Weiss, and I'm married to Professor Krolik here. And we're in our home in Mount Washington and going to spend a little time with you wherever you are and talk a bit about the book that I most recently wrote, which is called The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote. And it's about the women's suffrage movement and the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which you probably know was the largest expansion of the um, right to vote in our nation's history. And it happened exactly 100 years ago. We're celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment right now. And it's a momentous moment in our, the history of our democracy. And so it has all kinds of relevance to today in ways that I didn't expect when I wrote this, um, finished the manuscript in the day before Election Day 2016, if you'll remember that, Julian. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's a book of history, but it turns out that it has a lot more resonance today than I expected it to have when I wrote it. I thought it was just a good history. Um, now it's even more meaningful with all sorts of levels of uh, meaning and relevance and um, uh, importance than, than I even expected it to have. Yeah, in fact, that's what your editor told you the day after election day. Yes, yes. That was their immediate reaction. Um, I mean, in truth, we thought this book, which I began in 2013, would be published uh, in the first uh, term of the first woman president. And that would have been the crowning conclusion of this book of seven gen, pardon me, of three generations of women working over seven decades to win the vote. And that didn't happen. Um, I had sent in the manuscript again on the Monday before election day, 2016. That's, I was right on deadline. My, um, my training is as a journalist, so I respect deadlines and that was my deadline. And I sent it in, pushed that button, it went out to my editor and my agent and they both wrote back, Great timing. Um, well, <laughs> 24 hours later, it was, did not seem such great timing, but my editor, who's a very wise and very experienced editor at Viking, um, which is part of Penguin Random House, said, you know, this book is actually more important now. And I didn't understand what she meant on that day or a couple of days afterwards when we regained consciousness. And I, I didn't really understand what she meant but now I do. And she was, she was wise to, to understand that so quickly. Okay. Maybe let's roll back a little bit for our audience's sake. Uh, and you can explain how you came to the subject in the first place. Yeah. So um, again, my training and my experience is as a journalist, a long form journalist. I've written for many of the Hopkins magazines <laughs> over the years. Um, I helped develop um, uh, what was then Hopkins Public Radio Station, WJHU, uh, which is now WYPR. And so I've, I've spent my career in magazine journalism and in public radio. I was editor of Warfield's Magazine way back when, but that was uh, published by the Daily Record here in Baltimore. But I realized that as an American woman, as a woman, um, pretty politically active and aware family and a, a very dedicated voter. I dedicate the book to my parents who took me into the voting booth with them when I was a little girl and had me help them push the levers. It was levers at that time. It was mechanical. And then there was a big um, throttle kind of uh, handle that you would pull over and that would register your vote and it would also a uh, whip open the curtain because that was your privacy curtain it would open it like a, almost like a stage 
And it was very dramatic, it was very exciting. And, and that gave me this idea that voting was very important uh, and was something you grew up to want to do. And, and I taught, we've taught our children that that is something you do, you vote in every election and not just the presidential election, but every interim and off, off year election. And, but- and In fact, our son likes to take what he calls vacations in democracy. Right. Every time there's a major general election, he tries to arrange his work so he can take a few vacation days and go somewhere on behalf of a campaign he support, that he, whose candidate he supports. Right. He's done that now all the way back to uh, 2008. Yep, congressional candidates, presidential candidates. Uh, sometimes he's able to use his Spanish uh, to, uh, to get to the um, to potential voters. But so, so voting is a really important thing in, in our family. And, but I realized that at one, I didn't know how women obtained the vote. I, I had no idea. I knew that at some point, you know, the constitution did not include women uh, as voters. And then at another point we were able to vote. And if you had asked me before I began my research, when that happened, exactly when, I would have no idea. And you know, I studied history. I'm pretty knowledgeable about these things. I don't think Julian understood when women obtained the vote, did you? I knew when, but I certainly knew nothing of the detailed process of how it got there. Right. So, and it just seemed to be, well, most of the other um, developed countries were doing it all about the same time. And just see, people thought it was a natural, finally got around the idea that it was a natural thing to do. Ha uh ha, -huh. no, it was not the natural thing to do. And I had no idea. Um, and that bothered me. I asked my friends, um, you know, they're very well-read, well-educated men and women. And I said, do you know how American women obtain the vote? And they would look at me with this kind of vague look and say, uh, Seneca Falls, something about Seneca Falls. And I realized this was a problem. Um, this was something, this was a major, major event or, or process. And we, as Americans, had no idea. And so I started exploring it. And I have to say, I was, um, I came upon the idea of writing the book the way it is written, which is concentrating on the last state to have to ratify the 19th Amendment, which turns out to be Tennessee in the summer of 1920. But I didn't begin with that concept. And I think it, it's kind of interesting, and I, authors will often tell you that they come to their stories or the way they tell their stories, sometimes by serendipity. And that certainly, certainly uh, was the case for me. I was reading a report in the Library of Congress, which had been, um, which was entered there 75, 85 years ago. It was a hundred page report about how a bequest by a donor uh, to the suffrage movement, how her bequest had been spent. Now it was a very major bequest. It was probably the largest bequest to the movement ever. It was $2 million. And it was- um, Which was serious money in 19 Yeah, more than $50 million now in the equivalent kind of- uh, Hopkins would have been glad to have. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They would have named a school after her. Um, so it was a, a large bequest by this fascinating woman named Miriam Leslie, who was a, a publisher in New York. And I was fascinated by Miriam Leslie because she was a liberated woman way before her time. Julian got kind of fascinated by her too because I would tell him stories. <laughs> she lived a very, very colorful life. She had four husbands, many lovers. She uh, uh, made and, and spent fortunes. She um, drove several of her husbands into asylums. Um, she was just one into an asylum. Hmm, okay. Well, <laughs> she, was, she was brilliant and um, very controversial. And I just found her, you know, this 19th century a uh, very um, larger than life woman. And so that's, I was reading about her. I, I knew that, that she had given this money to the suffrage movement. And so I was reading about this in the report and it explained how the money was 
um, spent. Now, in, as a journalist, I do know the maxim, uh, follow the money, and that is absolutely true. And so I was following the money, how was the money spent? And it turned out that some of the money was used for the lobbying effort uh, for the 19th Amendment in Washington, because the uh, federal amendment, what we call the 19th Amendment, was stuck in Congress for 40 years, 40 years. And at the very end, the last like four years, they really, the suffragists had um, lobbying headquarters in Washington where they bombarded Congress. And then uh, some of it went to the uh, public relations operations, which were very sophisticated, pumping out information about uh, women and their accomplishments. The third was to establish legal women voters. Uh, and the fourth was for the ratification efforts in the states. You don't really think of the process of an amendment that it has to go through Congress and then it has to be um, approved by three quarters of the legislatures of the states in the union. At that time, there were 48 states, so it was 36 states had to be, had to ratify. And at the end of the story of, of this accounting, which really was an accounting uh, of the money spent, it talked about what happened in Tennessee, the last fight, uh, ratification fight. And it was just startling. It was dramatic, it was wild, it was unexpected. And I remember coming down, making dinner, and I said to Julian, wow, I just came upon this amazing story. And I remember you said, well, it's a great story, but is there more to it? Is it any more than an anecdote? Um, it was a rousing finish. In fact, one of the many things I learned from her research was just what a near thing it was that the amendment was approved at all. Yeah. That each step in the process, it survived by the barest minimum possible. In each of the houses of Congress, when it had to get two thirds votes in the House and in the Senate, in, when it went to Tennessee, that would be the 36th state, and they knew that they weren't going to get any more. So it had to be that or it was dead. And then in Tennessee, it was by the closest possible margin. So it really came as close to failing as it could and still survive. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the, the whole aspect of this story um, suddenly I realized that I could tell this very dramatic story of what happened in Tennessee, but because of the people who were there participating in this free-for-all, I mean, it was like a slug, a political slugfest, um, because of the people who were there on the scene, it would be very natural for me to, to reach back to, to um, pull back the lens and be able to tell the whole story of the women's suffrage movement, which begins in the middle of the 19th century. And so I, I was lucky enough to have this cast of characters who are both there in, in Tennessee or in Washington getting reports um, or reaching back to uh, Elizabeth Stanton and, and Lucretia Mott and, and Susan Anthony. And I could tell the whole story in flashback um, while the reader is in Tennessee. So it was a, a very fortunate uh, serendipity in the, in the stacks, as I call it. And I realized that this was the way to tell this story. And then I began my, my research um, and went on a few trips. Yeah, in fact, maybe you should elaborate on just what it means to do the research for a book like this. And, you know, talk about the ups and downs. Um, were there frustrations when there was some particular set of documents that you really wanted to get your hands on and just couldn't for one reason or another? And were there just marvelous things that you stumbled upon? Yeah. I mean, the research is my favorite part. Uh, I, I love the writing, but the research is, is fun. Now, it's exhausting as any, uh, there are lots of uh, you in the audience who have done research uh, in your own career, certainly uh, in your own education. This is like one huge, huge, term paper, and it took me to quite a few archives. The first research trip, besides the Hopkins Library, which I'm able to use Eisenhower and, and start reading just in the general, uh, the general 
it's a dirty secret is that I use Eisenhower Express predominantly for her books. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, so we, I was able to start reading from there, but then I was, uh, took my first research trip to Nashville, as the story is situated in Nashville. Luckily, the State Library and Archives kept meticulous records of what happened there in the summer of 1920. Basically, this, this um, uh, political brawl takes place over six or eight weeks in, in Nashville. And they kept every record, every scrap of paper, every telegram. It was amazing. So I had to go to the State Library and Archives and sit there from the time they opened until the time they closed and stayed at the cheapest place I could find and took a bus to the archives every day. It was, you know, 100 degrees outside. I went in mid-August, uh, which is when much of the book takes place. And part of it was it, it was a convenient time to go, but it also I wanted to feel the heat of Nashville in summer. Now, Baltimore summers can be really intense. We're having a bit of a heat wave right now. And I'm a we're both northerners, so it 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 feels really intense to us and has since we moved here over 35 years ago. But in in the descriptions I was uh, reading about uh, the fight in Nashville, I realized that the heat, everyone talked about the heat. It was an exceptionally hot spell in the summer in Nashville. And everyone wrote about the heat. The northerners who were there wrote about how this was unbearable, how this made everybody tempers flare. And I realized the heat was actually a character in this, in this story. You should tell about the anecdote that her daughter uh, wanted you to open the book with. Yes. Well, I, it's in the book. It just, it just doesn't open. Um, during this heat spell, I, I came upon a memoir uh, by one of the, the main characters, Josephine Pearson, who leads the anti-suffrage contingent, uh, president of the Tennessee Women Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And uh, she comes from her home in Southern, uh, she lives in the mountains of Southern Tennessee in the Cumberland Plateau. And she comes to Nashville and it's really hot and she's not used to this heat. And she takes the cheapest room she can find in the Hermitage Hotel where everybody is staying. And she, um, <laughs> she spends the night in the bathtub, naked in the bathtub. You want to um, imagine she's a sort of woman who's, you know, in the Marx Brothers movies, they often have this matron, this, this society matron, who's um, sort of older and kind of on the heavy side. That's Josephine Pearson. Right, so she, she's in the, you've got to kind of imagine this, and she's in a bathtub uh, with one of the old fashioned telephones in her hands, and she is calling up and sending, she's sent, sending telegrams, um, to her allies around the country, the anti-suffrage women, to come to Nashville to help in this fight. So, um, and I began to understand this because the heat really enveloped me when I was there doing that first um, foray of research. And what was really exciting was Nashville has preserved not only these records, but they also, a lot of the places where my story was going to take place looked very much the way they would have been. Uh, the State House uh, looks, except for, you know, they probably uh, refurbished the chambers, but the, the bones are the same. Uh, I, could, I could look and see where these things happened. Uh, Union Station, which is no longer a, um, it's no longer a, a railroad station, it's now a hotel but they've kept it and I could see all the sculpture and, and the uh, architectural elements which would have been there in 1920 when, when everyone is, is coming and going through the Union Station. And I could describe it, looking at the pictures and then looking at what was there. So I was taking a lot of photographs, which I used a lot. I was counting the number of steps up to the visitor's gallery in the state house because I knew that's where the women had to go to watch the proceedings. 
and had to think of it without air conditioning uh, in the middle of the summer and they're wearing 10 pounds of clothes. Um, <laughs> there were no little sundresses at the time. So I, I began to be able to understand it and feel this in a more visceral fashion of what it felt like to be there. I, I sometimes call it method acting for, for writers. And it was very helpful. It was uncomfortable, but it was very helpful. And then my research took me to the Library of Congress, to uh, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, which is uh, this wonderful, wonderful repository for many, uh, for the history of uh, American women, but also a special um, uh, quality of collections of the, of the suffragists. And I was there, I went to Harrisburg because there was an unpublished memoir that somehow was, was in a library there. So I was able to chase these down, but I was also able to use a lot of electronic uh, resources, which hadn't existed when I wrote my first book. And thanks to some connections that Johns Hopkins enables us to have, I was able to read historic newspapers, including the Tennessee papers. I was able to uh, get documents that not too many had been digitized yet, but I could read the, the newspapers in a digital form. And that was, you know, amazingly helpful. So I'm reading letters, I'm reading memoirs, I'm reading official communications. And there's always this moment when you go, oh, wow. And you have this little document up on your screen and it's, you know, a note of, of a, you know, a nurse in South Dakota sending a quarter into the suffragists and saying, basically, you go girl, um, you know, win us the vote. And you see this and, and, you know, you see the envelope, you see her handwriting and it's, it's, it's really quite moving. Um, another amazing moment is when I was able to tap into the um, Knoxville Library in Tennessee and actually see the letter that um, becomes you really a, get this away? No, <laughs> a pivotal <laughs> moment in the book. Uh, you see the letter, uh, all seven pages, and you see the envelope, and you see how it's addressed. And all of that I was able to use in the book. So um, the research is just a joy. And the challenge for, for every writer is, OK, when do you have to stop the research? Because you could go on forever. And I might have. Um, but at, at a certain point, you have to say, I have to start writing now. And that's a, that's a hard transition. And then you have to control the inevitable urge to put every single thing yes. you learned into right. this book. Right, right. Um, notebook dump, as we call it. Yeah. And it's deciding what goes in and what goes out and, and what doesn't make the cut, what shapes the story. I mean, that's the other thing. I am writing, I'm not writing an academic paper. I'm not writing an academic book. I'm writing a popular book. And and I'm not a suffrage scholar. And I was nervous about that at first. But basically my editor said, you just have to be scrupulous. You just have to make sure all of your uh, facts are cited and properly uh, acknowledged and that you're careful with the history as a historian should be. And occasionally I was the enforcer. Yes, that's right. She wanted to have a character opening the door and looking in. No, knocking, uh, knocking, knocking on the door. door. Yes, this was a really valuable and lesson. I said, do you have an account mentioning that? Yeah, yep. And she said, no, not exactly, but she must have. <laughs> right, <laughs> no, that, that, was, that was early on. And Julian is my first reader on all of this. He reads uh, the chapters. I, I, I'm a, a revisionist uh, in that I, I write, I revise, I write, I revise. And so by the time I show it to him, a chapter or a part of a chapter, it's, it's pretty well formed and written. And he was reading an early uh, draft and he saw that I had a character, I wanted a little motion 
in, this, in the description. And I had her knocking on the door. I know she enters the door because she has this conversation with the woman inside. So I had her innocently knocking on the door. And Julian said, do you know that she knocked on the door? <laughs> I said, no, well, no, but she must have. And he very, very wisely said, no, you can't do that. It's just like in journalism, you get have to spell the name right because that there's a, a level of trust with your reader. And you have to establish that trust that what you're telling them, you can verify that you're not making this up, that you are getting this from the historical record. And, and at first I just looked and said, picky, picky, picky. But he was very right. And that I kept that lesson in my head at all times. And so I changed it. I changed it. I had her enter the room and I described her. I didn't have her knocking on the door. But that lesson stayed with me. And, and I would use that as a, as a measuring stick when I was writing a scene and saying, okay, how do you know that? How do you know she's standing on the porch with him? And then I could say, I have a photograph. Okay, that's all right. So, uh, and, and then I have to have, there are 750 end notes in the, in the end of the book. And you don't have to read them. <laughs> but they are all there. And I describe how, how I got that information. I often, I do use a lot of dialogue. And I'm often asked by my readers or my audiences, did you make that up? You know, did you just make up that, that piece of dialogue? And I said, no, if you look in the back of the book, you'll see where I got that. And that was because I'm working with primary documents and I'm working with secondary. So I have, I have the letters, I have their memos to, to headquarters. I have their, um, and sometimes personal letters where they're describing this. But then I also have newspaper reports which quote them. A particularly good example of your reliance on genuine documents and having the trust of the reader, the reader would understand that this was for real, is in what for me is one of the most moving parts of the book. It's about a third of the way in where Carrie Catt, the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, in the book, is portrayed as going through a sort of soliloquy. It's as if you're reading her mind, but it's all based on real letters, real conversations that were recorded. And so striking because what is passing through her mind is about how her several strongly held idealistic views, in this case, are actually coming into conflict with each other. And she'll have to give way on some of them in order to make progress on another, namely the cause of women's suffrage. And it really makes her come alive as a real human to have these genuine difficulties with how to balance moral compromises in one direction in order to actually achieve something in another. And that's, you, you were able to do all that because you had the actual documents to work on. Yeah, and one of my goals in, in writing the book was to make these women, and, and men, but, but mostly the women, um, who are the, the stars of the story, come, become three-dimensional characters so that you understand them as women, as conflicted political actors, as committed activists, but also as friends and wives and mothers and sisters. Um, because especially in suffrage history, if we know about it at all, and there's not a lot of knowledge, it's basically that women demanded the vote in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention, and then in 1920, they were given the vote. Well, that's not how it happened. But also, if we know anything, we know it's Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they did it all. Uh, they started the movement. Them, <laughs> yeah, they started the movement themselves. They ran it the whole time. They got the 19th Amendment through Congress. I mean, it, that's all we know. We know these two names, perhaps. And I, I first of all, wanted to bring out all the amazing women who were leaders, both at the national level and state level and local levels, as much as I can. And also to make them real, 
So that carry cat, I know from documents and biographies and her own writings that she had these conflicts, that she worried about this, that she was making conscious compromises with her own ideals um, to further the cause. And this makes her real, this makes her human. And also, I, I'm not sure if this actually made the cut in the editing, I keep forgetting, but I loved a document, a letter she wrote back to New York, to a friend in New York from her time in Nashville. And she said, the heat is just unrelenting. And if perspiration could, um, could do it, I'd come home thin. And I thought, here is probably the most powerful woman in the world, right, at that moment in 1920. Certainly the most well-known woman in the world. And maybe not a Hari was more well-known, but, um, and here she is writing to her friend, worried about her weight. And I thought, this makes her human. This makes this history not just an embalmed historical moment, but it shows that history is made by flawed human beings and vain human beings and ordinary human beings. And, and that was part of what I wanted to imbue these characters with was their real personality. And so they you have, the, you know, her, her uh, one of the suffragists from Ohio who has, is famous for her sense of humor and I wanted to bring that out. So that was really um, something I hoped to be able to do and as, we talked about, I had to shape the narrative in a way that I had never had to um, use writing techniques I'd not used before as a journalist or even as a popular historian in my first book. Yes, in fact, you had a particular struggle because although nobody knew how, how it got there, everyone knew how it turns out. Yeah. So you had to somehow maintain suspense despite people coming in saying, I know what the ending is. Right, exactly. And you were actually very helpful with that too. Remember, I'm not alone all the time writing this book. So Julian is my only sounding board for the most part. And, and you would come home for dinner from, from the university and you would ask me a question many, many evenings. And you'd say, so did you make the reader forget they know how it turns out? And that was also very useful because I realized that in whatever I wrote, I needed to lead up to this and not um, assume, I didn't want my readers to assume that this was going to be a march to easy victory. And so I had to use, again, techniques like suspense, which I never used before. And I had to learn to uh, master things like narrative beats, which I had never used before. And, and that's basically telling your reader what they need to know and nothing more at each, at each point. And one of the comments I find most gratifying from my readers or from the audience, reviewers. yeah, the reviewers, um, is saying, wow, I knew how it turns out because I'm able to vote, but I began to get nervous. I wasn't sure how they were gonna pull this off. And that is very gratifying to me because that's what I needed to do. I needed to make the reader feel just as the suffragists did, the anxiety of really not being sure this was gonna work at all. I wanted you to feel the heat, I wanted you to feel the anxiety, the sense of betrayal when they are betrayed by, by lawmakers and, and politicians um, or their own colleagues. And I wanted you to feel that sense of hopelessness at the, towards the end where they really don't think they're going to make it. So that was, part of what I had to learn to do as a writer uh, was to use these techniques to, to enhance uh, the, the sense of what the stakes are or were. And, uh, and that was helpful when you would ask me, so did you make them forget? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and did you build up the antis so they weren't comic book characters who could be easily pushed over, but real people who had their own strengths and who had their own arguments. That's, that's right. That was another thing you were really helpful with was um, it's kind of easy to make fun of some of the anti-suffrage 
um, antagonists who, who, who come to Nashville to plead the cause of rejecting the 19th Amendment. And we have Josephine Pearson, who is a very um, caloric character. She has she writes with big exclamation marks and underlining. You could almost feel her her temper rising in, in her in her letters that I her handwritten letters. And she is surrounded by a group of very interesting women. And it's easy to make them into cartoon um, targets um, and to score some kind of funny cheap shots with them. But you were very wise in telling me you have to make them worthy opponents of the suffragists. Yeah. Otherwise, this whole story doesn't make sense. Yeah. And there's a reason why just barely under half of the legislature voted no. Yeah. Um, there, there's lots of reasons. The, the, the arguments of the anti-suffrage women are part of that. Um, and some of those, many of those are racist arguments. They don't want black women to vote. Um, other anti-suffrage forces are uh, corporate interests who feel that women voting in general will be bad for their bottom line. And so they're there pumping dark money into the anti-campaign. Right. And, and in Tennessee, the overlap between the temperance and the suffrage movements right. was large enough that the bourbon industry, um, prohibition or no, uh, was very concerned about suffrage. Right, that's why there's the Jack Daniels suite. The Top uh, floor of the Hermitage Hotel. Right, the anti-suffragists have this like hospitality suite, which gets dubbed the Jack Daniels suite after Tennessee's favorite liquor. And um, their the legislators are plied 24 <clears throat> seven with uh, booze to convince them that they should not allow women uh, to vote. They shouldn't ratify because even though prohibition's in effect, they're hoping that if they can keep women away from the polls for a couple of election cycles, maybe prohibition won't be enforced quite as stringent quite as stringently. And so they're trying to keep women away. Yes, there's that wonderful moment when someone placed a bottle of bourbon under Carrie Cat's pillow. Right. Right. That's a you know, she was that, trying to figure out how to dispose of it. Right. She she says she makes her colleagues drive out of the countryside and she buries it under a, a wall. Um, yeah, there's some really great scenes which you you know you couldn't make up in fiction. They're just they're so wild. There are fist fights, there's kidnappings, there's all kinds of things. But I needed to explain who the anti suffragists were, the anti suffrage women who are opposing their sisters getting the vote. And that becomes a really important and surprising part of the book. I think when my readers or my audiences, because I've been touring around the country, um, talk, uh, ask, you know, say to me, the most surprising thing for them was that there, there were women opposed to getting the vote. And I need to explain that. And one of the really fascinating things for me is besides the fact that some of their arguments are still arguments we hear today, still arguments being used either to um, oppose women working outside the home or, or the uh, women entering the highest echelons of government or, or corporate life, um, arguments against the Equal Rights uh, Amendment are all pretty much taken from what these anti-suffragists were saying more than a hundred years ago. And I also find it interesting that uh, uh, the anti-suffrage movement was able to in its own way, live on, which I trace in the last chapter of the book, into um, organizations of conservative women throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. So it's important to understand these anti-suffrage women because we, they are, uh, their legacy is is really with us and uh, is important. And then, as we uh, bring this conversation to a close, and also for the present. Um, you might want to talk about some of the interesting people you've met yeah. as a result of publishing this book. It's been, she's been traveling in, in uh, 
circles she never thought she would. <laughs> it's been an interesting ride, hasn't it? Um, yeah, I, I've been uh, away from home, ex except for since March and the pandemic, um, I've been traveling a great deal and touring the country and, and lots of invited talks and that's been wonderful. I've also had some extraordinary experiences, including a few, just a few weeks after the book was published, uh, I received a communication. Phone message. A phone message that- um, From your agent. From my agent, that um, secretary, former secretary of state Hillary Clinton wanted to get in touch with me. And turns out she had read the book and was very impressed with it and did not know the details of the story and thought it was a very important story to tell and so asked me to come to New, to New York and we met. And it was a, um, a fascinating meeting and we agreed to partner on telling the story to the largest audience possible because it, it is an important story both of understanding what it took to get women the vote, to expand our democracy, because this asks large questions about, about democracy, uh, which are really relevant for today, not just 100 years ago. And so we are developing a, a TV series, which will tell the story and also bring in other uh, relevant issues of, of voting rights and uh, racial politics and all the themes in the book. And so that is in development and we've been working together and it's been um, a pleasure and a joy. And I bring home tales to, to Julian and it's, it's really been very exciting. Um, been doing a lot of media and just recorded something for CBS this morning. So while Julian was you know, teaching his graduate seminar in, what was it? Then? Oh, well, it wasn't really a seminar, it was actually a graduate class. Okay. Um, every aspect of the student needs to know about stellar structure. Stellar structure, it was in stellar structure. Um, I was here in the next room, you know, doing interviews for PBS and, and things like that. So it's, it's been this very interesting time when we're both at home, both working, uh, he's, set up shop in the den. I'm usually upstairs in my office. And I've met these, besides Secretary Clinton, these just fascinating women around the country who have coalesced around the story, around voting rights. I've done a lot of work with League of Women Voters. And some of them are commemorating the event in an unusual way. Yes, well, there's, uh, there are the sculptures and I have, there are some wonderful sculptures uh, around Tennessee, and there's going to be a new one in New York commemorating this, uh, the suffragists. There's uh, the room in the library of the Nash National Public Library that's going to be an educational resource to tell the story. There are the skydivers. I'm, I'm the historical uh, consultant to the Women's Skydiving Network, which has its Project 19, which is just fascinating. They had their first jump earlier uh, this past weekend at Seneca Falls. And um, they are jumping in suffrage colors, wearing suffrage color jumpsuits, and they have historically correct banners coming out of their parachutes. And they're going to be- And reciting the text of the 19th, 19th Amendment, Amendment while as they, they jump. free fall head, um, head down from 18,000 to 10,000 feet. Well, that, yeah. Information. Well, there's going to be several jumps. That's going to be a, a, a record jump. It was supposed to take place this month. It's had to be postponed until next year. But that's when 100, 101 women, because it'll be 101st anniversary, will be jumping from five airplanes in formation to set a world record while reciting the 19th Amendment, and then we'll, we'll uh, parachute down. These are smaller jumps uh, over sites that are important in the history. So Seneca Falls, there's going to be one in um, Nashville. Uh, I believe there's going to be one in um, perhaps in New York. So there are these, these other commemorations. There was going to be a motorcycle brigade 
of thousands of women going from Tennessee up to Washington, again, postponed. But in every community, there were, there are women uh, and men planning these commemorations of the, of the centennial. There's going to be bell ringing in one in, in Nashville. There's going to be motorcades. Uh, they're trying to adapt. And the centennial, I am told, is going to continue into 2021. The stretched centennial. The stretch centennial plus. That's what they're calling it. And uh, it's important because there's there's also lessons that we have to learn. And some of them we're seeing play out on our TV or computer screens right now. The idea of protest. Uh, the suffragists picketed. They were the first group to ever picket the White House. And uh, um, one one wing of the of the movement, the National Women's Party, the more radical wing, protested at the gates of the White House for months at a time. In Lafayette Square. In that's what I was going to say. And in Lafayette Square, their their actually their offices were on Lafayette Square, one of those townhouses, and they were arrested there and in prison. And when I saw the um, and treated quite harshly. Very harshly, um, force-fed, tortured in some cases. And when I saw the protests in Lafayette Park uh, a month or so ago and saw the police storming and, and clearing the area, I have to say, I thought of the National Women's Party. Um, the racial aspect of this story is, is very, very important, uh, both within the movement, also the use, the how the anti-suffragists weaponize race as a an issue um, to to try to thwart ratification and thwart women's suffrage because it will allow black women to vote and then of course after the 19th amendment we know what happens which is the 19th amendment which does give the vote to all women uh, all women citizens is subverted by the Jim Crow laws in the South. Just the way they subverted the 14th and 15th. Exactly. And, Same tools. And so that for Black women in the Southern states, the fight would go on for another four decades until the Voting Rights Act. And for Asian Americans and for Native American women and men who were not considered citizens in 1920, again, that fight would go on for decades. And here we find ourselves in late, Night, uh, late, I still live in that, like 2020 um, and voter suppression and voting rights are an essential controversial issue at the moment. And it's, uh, again, it's a question of how do we see ourselves as a democracy? Why should we be afraid of our citizens voting? And that's the question this book asks. And I think we're still asking that question. And it also taught us that the concept of universal suffrage, at least in the United States, has been a goal. Yeah. And we make a step or two toward it, and then we lose ground a step or two, and, and hope that we get ever closer and closer, but it has never reached quite to 100%. Right, and the, and the other part of this, uh, so, so as I've toured in in the last two years, one of the messages I bring, besides read my book, please, is this idea of voting rights uh, and how we can't look at it as a partisan issue. This is the health of our democracy and how we owe it both to the suffragists and to the civil rights workers, to John Lewis, to Elijah Cummings, that we need to keep fighting for the right to vote without fear, without intimidation, without difficulty for all our citizens and, and not restrict it. And too many states are restricting it. Luckily, uh, Maryland is not, but we should talk about the fact that Maryland was not a hero in the suffered story. Maryland the, never was able to hold a referendum at the state level, because they knew it would not pass um, to give women the vote. And when it came to the 19th Amendment, Maryland rejected it. It was one of the states that refused to ratify. In fact, did not officially ratify until 
1941. And then it, for some reason, it wasn't technically all signed off with all the uh, T's crossed until 1958. So again, this was uh, based on racial politics. They didn't want black women to vote. And so Maryland is really plays the heavy in this book because they not only reject, but then they send emissaries out to convince the other Southern states to reject. So the, I believe the Senate president and several Maryland delegates are in Nashville trying to convince their Tennessee colleagues to reject the 19th Amendment as they did. And then Maryland filed suit, even after Tennessee right. had put it over the top, right. arguing that the process had been improper. Uh, and yes. that wasn't resolved for another couple of years. Right, William Marbury, a uh, famous name in legal circles, but uh, he filed suit saying it, that the 19th Amendment uh, was in conflict with the Maryland state constitution. And that suit does not get settled until 1922 in the US Supreme Court, when they're told, no, um, sorry, federal amendment takes, pro takes priority, S takes precedence, I guess. So um, Maryland, I'm happy to say, is no longer such a problem when it comes to voting rights, but it certainly had to go through some evolving to get there. So what was it like to have your wife, um, first of all, kind of trapped up there for a couple of years uh, writing this, and then out there um, in public, I'm, I'm away from home a lot, these days, well, not these days, but I was hope to again, and talking to all these big audiences and doing things that I normally didn't do here at home. Well, I guess one way to express it is that when you're in the process of writing, you were so deeply involved. There were a lot of evenings I'd come back from work, oh, 730, 8 o'clock, holler upstairs. <laughs> Are you thinking of eating supper tonight? Right. Uh, and, right. <laughs> and more recently, as you've been uh, traveling around and hobnobbing and so on, yeah. it's been a, kind of fun hearing the anecdotes. Um, there's your great exchange with um, Secretary Clinton about her new grandchild. Right, right. Um, yeah, I've got to meet lots of descendants of the suffragists, mm -hmm. which has been great fun, and even some of the anti-suffragists. Um, I've made many acquaintances around the country, which are, are really very exciting and special to me, and just learned a lot about different industries, learning about the film industry and Hollywood, which is quite an education, and also uh, being on the other side of, of the interview process where I, as a journalist, was often the one giving, uh, asking the questions, and now I'm on the other side and I'm answering the questions. And that's, that's been kind of a kick too. So um, while you do your equations downstairs, I'm doing my sentences upstairs. Yes. And uh, he still asks, what's for dinner? <laughs> well, I think we have come to the end of our uh, chat and just wanted to thank everyone for tuning in and remind you that I will hope you will tune in again. I will be giving the Mary Elizabeth Garrett lecture at the medical institutions on September 30th. Really? for the medical institutions this year, because it too will be coming to you through the net right. from I, our living room. Right, I won't be in East Baltimore. I'll be in West Baltimore. And I hope you'll join us for a discussion, not only of the suffrage movement, but also of Mary Elizabeth Garrett's role in the suffrage movement, which is really quite fascinating. We know her role at Hopkins and how important that was. And it really fits into a broader uh, view of her 
commitment to women's rights and women's education. So I hope you'll join us then.